Let's begin. Uh, please make sure you're fine-tuned to my announcements on Canvas. There's going to be a lot of them as we get to the end of the semester. Today is the last day where you can submit a category award nomination. I didn't receive anything, so I'm just going to pick the ones from last year. Okay, and then I will ask for nominations for students, uh, for student awards. Remember, you're going to get this a fancy certificate that you get to hang on the wall and you know be proud of, and you get a 3D printed lobster. Okay, so you can nominate yourself, a colleague. I would really appreciate you doing any, some nominations, okay, once I send out that announcement or email, okay? We are almost done. We're almost done. Today, I hope to finish the course, you know, uh, end it all, okay, before Thursday's lecture. So I'm giving you an overview of what's going to happen in the, these last two weeks. So we are now, we're going to finish ODEs today. If there's time, I'll touch on PDEs. If not, you know, we'll learn PDEs later in life. On Thursday, we'll have Dr. Camilla Zdeibel um, from Belgium. She's a former student here and colleague and collaborator. Uh, she'll, be, she'll be zooming in and talking to all of you about machine learning, which is great. I'll also send you some information on what you need to install. This is completely optional and for your benefit. It's not on the exam or anything like that. Okay, but just for your curiosity um, to try to understand how these neural networks work from a kind of uh, intuitive perspective, engineering perspective. On Tuesday, the 23rd, so before I get to Tuesday, Thursday of next week is your final exam. And it is going to be a handwritten exam. Yes. For the intro machine learning, since it's on Zoom, is there a Zoom option for me to watch at home? Y yeah. Yeah, that'll be, yeah, there will be that, definitely. I'll send, once I send the announcement, I'll do the, uh, I'll send the link. It'll be more fun if you come here. Okay, okay. All right. Um, so for the final exam, it will be of the handwritten type. You got two hours. The, I don't set the time. The university sets the time. It will be in this class from one to three. Uh, look at the announcement I sent this morning. If you didn't see it in the email, go on the Canvas page, click announcements. There's a lot of details on what to expect, but roughly you'll get, uh, it's comprehensive in the sense that, yeah, you know, you might get a nonlinear equation, but, you know, I, because it's part of differential equations, right? And so that's the sense it is, it is comprehensive, but the focus will be on ODEs. You'll get three to four problems on ODEs one to two problems on regression, so model fitting regression or give you a few data points and do, and do a fit, and one, one general comprehension questions, like what's the difference between this type of error and that type of error? Would you use relative error here or nominal error, et cetera, okay? So one question, just general comprehension question, one to two problems on regression, three to four problems on ordinary differential equations. Now remember, with ODEs, I can exercise linear systems, I can exercise nonlinear systems, right? So those are part, just like your, if you do your homeworks nine and 10, if you comprehend them, you'll be all set for the final, I think for the ODE section, okay? Um, and you'll get two cheat sheets, uh, you know, fill them up uh, with the stuff you want. Next Tuesday, it will be the last lecture, okay? Um, we're, I reserve that last lecture for closure and for doing activities together. Um, it's always nice to just finish the course with a sense of like, yeah, this is what we did. We're going to just relax a little bit. I'll bring in pizza and uh, uh, some other foods uh, for everyone. And uh, I'll ask you to do student uh, feedback. So I'll step out so that I don't influence your feedback, right? So I'll step out. Now, this year, the feedback is going to count as one homework assignment, okay? So remember, you have 10 assignments so far, and this one would be 11. I'll drop two, so you'll have nine homework assignments. And if you count the grade, homework assignments are 32.5% of the grade. So that one homework assignment counts for 3.6% of your total grade. So almost 3.5 points of your entire grade over 100, okay? The condition, though, is that you have to be present in class to do it because I want you to be part of the activities, okay? If you already fulfilled the student feedback, just come to class and you'll just upload a little screenshot that I have, the screenshot when you complete the student feedback on the website, it shows completed. Um, so you all, that's all you have to do. 
So you'll come in here, you'll sit, um, there's going to be a sign-in sheet, you'll write your name, you come in, you do the student feedback, it counts, it will count as an assignment. If you, you, you're, you're not obliged to do that, but uh, then it will not count as an additional assignment for you. So it's like a free, free point. I like to hit 100% rate. Um, and over the last three years, uh, pretty much the only one in college, I've had 100% a response rate, and I like to keep it this year, whatever the cost is, right? Three, five percent, you know, some professors are doing two percent. No, I'm gonna do three and a half percent this year, okay? So, you know, win-win for everyone, and I get to refine the course better, we get a bigger sample. Um, so it's win-win for everyone, okay? Um, the, then we will have student awards, so once I get your nominations for students, I'll put in a Google form and you go and nominate your students. We'll see the winners in real time. And then once I get the winners down, I'll, pre I'll, give, them the, I'll give you the certificates um, in about a week with that 3D printed lobster. Then I do this thing called Manifesto for Life. It's a little story about where I come from and you know, what I went through in life, etc. for you to get to know me a little bit more. And uh, because I've gotten to know you quite a bit so far. And finally, I, I, oh, I do this thing called Ask Me Anything. Uh, it's completely anonymous, and uh, so I open up this Google chat. You log in anonymously, and you can ask whatever question you want. It, you know, it could be as offensive as you want. I don't have to answer it. You know, just be polite about it, right? <laughs> or, but just ask any question, right? I don't have to answer the question. But, you know, people ask some really fun and interesting questions. Anything like, you know, show me a picture of your family. Like, did you, did, were you born without hair? You know, where do you buy your shoes from? So, anything, right? And so, uh, things like that. It's a fun way to talk. Many, many students end up asking career advice questions like, how did you know do you want to do a PhD? Why did you choose chemical engineering? I didn't choose chemical engineering. Chemical engineering chose me. So really, I'm a mechanical engineer by trade and training. And so uh, anyway, the questions like that. Um, and, th and we'll keep it open until the end of the, of the session while you're eating your pizza and um, uh, ch relaxing. OK, I, I hope you will attend. Um, and I in really encourage you to do that. It's a, it's a great, fun lecture. Ask your junior that's just junior students or the senior students about that last lecture they always tell you yeah it's it's worth it actually i have so, the juniors from last year uh, many of them want to come this year not for the free pizza of course you know but uh, just because it's just fun and uh, relaxing anyway we're almost done okay today i want to finish with the odes i know homework i know you're exhausted i it, and it's weird the end of the semester i wish we had one week between the end of semester and exams, you know, but the powers that be just kind of squeezed our exam just after that last lecture. So um, I, will ha I will be in the office. I'll be available by email, by Zoom, uh, even if I'm driving, whatever question you have, you know, midnight, three in the morning. If I'm up, I will answer you, okay? Uh, but I want you to, to, to prepare for the final exam. It's going to be an important part of your grade. Uh, and so I'll be available all the time. The homework, the last homework I think is due on Sunday. So you have some time to go through it. Make sure you, you do it. Make sure you do this homework nine and 10. I know two homework are gonna be dropped, right? But I urge you to attempt to do these two homework assignments. Okay, I to try at least to think about them because the final will be very similar to the questions on this, on this homework, okay? Um, all right, so let's get back to ODEs. I want to be done today, and then we can um, uh, just relax from course material. Uh, if you remember last time, we finished off with Solve BVP, and we talked about its, some of its limitations, and you know, we don't see what's going on behind the scenes. A more uh, useful method, more robust method, is to use directly finite difference methods on boundary value problems. So we did use finite difference methods, to do the initial value problems, right? We approximated the derivative either as a forward Euler approximation or a backward Euler approximation. That turned the total derivative into an algebraic formula between two points in time, n plus one and n. And be careful for the difference between subscript and superscript. There's no difference. Sometimes I use n plus one in the superscript or in the subscript. Some, some of your colleagues um, pointed that out to me. Um, that's just kind of by, by tradition. Um, there is, uh, this is not an exponent, it's not a power, 
Okay, whenever you're dealing with ODEs, this is not a power, it's just a time level. It's an accounting, a way to account for time level. And you'll see why I put it in the superscript when you do the nonlinear solver, because you need to use the subscript to do the iteration counter. So you have CK plus one at N plus one, right? So you need these two, subscript and superscript. So it's not a power or anything like that, it's just a time index, okay? Um, last time we went through the heated rod problem, we said this was our governing equation and then, uh, Oh, it's kind of hard to go through all of these one by one. We discretize the domain. We have our axes, et cetera, uh, and the boundary conditions for the temperature. I'm just kind of trying to go through. And then I, I made the argument that these equations are valid at all points um, on that rod. So we're going to apply that equation at each point. And then still, we still have a problem with the, the time derivative, right? And then we said, okay, we use a finite difference formula for the time derivative. And we use that central differencing, and then suddenly that turned this continuous derivative into an algebraic relation between the temperatures at the different points on the rod. We don't know those temperatures. We are trying to find them. And to find them, we're finding the governing equations of those temperatures. It turns out that you do this procedure at each and every point, and then you end up with a, uh, this is where we left off, a linear system of equations for all of the unknowns. So at point one, you have a fixed boundary condition. You're given the temperature, so T1 is T left. And then at point two, you start substituting I equal to in that formula up there, T3, etc. cetera, the, what, the point before last. And then the last point, the temperature is given to you, Tn is equal to T right. So when you look at this, your unknowns are T1, T2, T2, T3, sorry, T2, T3, T4, T5, all the way to Tn minus 1. But I still include T1 and Tn, although they're just a, it's, it's like a um, degenerate case, T1 is T left. I keep it in the system of equations because when I build the solution in Python, I just want the whole thing plotted from T1 to Tn, right? Not just focus on the interior points and plot the interior points only, right? So if you were to solve the points, if you exclude Tn and T1, these equations are enough sufficient to solve for the points in the interior. But then your solution is going to be missing the points at the ends. You have to manually add them. So I include the end points in the solution just as a convenience, okay? It doesn't affect the solution process at all. And in fact, when you look at the linear system in matrix form, the first equation is 1 T1 equal T left. And that's already the answer there. So it's not going to affect your solution at all. We know how to do this. We did it at the beginning of the semester numerous times with linalgebra.solve, and we built the diagonals, if you remember that. So we will do that again. And I put uh, some, uh, some code for you here, how to build this these system of equations. So just for the fun of it, let's grab our notebooks and redo it again so, so that we can refresh your memory about this. Okay. So let's just grab a notebook. Okay, I'm gonna do a new notebook. Go. So I'm going to just uh, import the boilerplate. All right. Oh, too big. Okay. All you need is NumPy for this one because you're going to use linalgebra.solve, okay? Let me bring the slides so I remember what we're trying to do. Okay, so I need to program this matrix. We're gonna need some, we're gonna need some uh, information for H, this, heat this effective heat transfer coefficient. I'm just gonna put in a number and we're gonna need a value for T left and T right, okay? And essentially I have minus two plus H delta X squared everywhere. So I need the length of the rod. We're gonna go from zero to one. I need some spacing. We'll put 200 points or 300 points. Okay, let's 
just come up with some numbers. All right, so number, let's say L is equal to one, so length of rod. We're going from um, zero to L on the rod. Um, N is the number of points, let's put 200, number of grid points. So these start from X equal zero to X equal one, okay, all the way to the end of the rod. And we can create a lint space. So that gives us the points from zero to L with N points, right? And I know I will need D delta X. So delta X is simply X1 minus X0, okay? So any, the difference between any two points in this lint space is the same because these are equidistant points. So that gives us the grid spacing. Remember, we need it in the formula here because we have h times delta x squared uh, in the diagonal and on the right-hand side, all right? Let's do t left is equal, let's say, uh, 300 Kelvin. And then t right is equal 200, we say Kelvins, okay? And t infinity is equal 500, so we're heating the rod. And the heat transfer coefficient, the effective heat transfer coefficient, remember in the, in the slides I combined uh, all of these together. It's HP over lambda AC, right? I combined them all into one coefficient, one value, okay? And I'm gonna put 10 just to demonstrate. All right, so we create the lower diagonal. Lower diagonal is mp dot ones of size n minus one, okay? Now the last entry on the lower diagonal is, if you remember the matrix, the last entry, so this is one, 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 everywhere, the last entry is zero, okay? The last entry is zero. I know this is not perfect, this, I should add one column and one, one row to this equation, um, but this is one, 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 and the last entry is zero. So I'll create it as a vector of size n minus one, and the last entry in that vector is zero. Exa this is, we did all of that when we were doing linear solvers. The only difference now is that you know how we got this system of equations, that's it. And you just used a numerical finite difference. That's all there is, right? I promised you in the beginning that I will teach you how to do it. It took us, what, you know, three, four months for a mo one minute of explanation, right? So. All right, create a, the diagonal, the main diagonal. Diagonal, MD is MP dot ones of size N, and I'm gonna do it as minus two plus H times DX squared, right? So H times MP dot ones, right? So it's minus two plus H delta X squared. And for the main diagonal, the first and last entries are one. So MD zero is one, 1.0, and MD, the last entry is 1.0. Okay, and create upper diagonal. Upper diagonal is also of size N minus one, right? Main diagonal is N, upper diagonal is N minus one, second upper is N minus two. And for the upper diagonal, the first entry is zero, right? You get zero, one, 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 everywhere. So the main entry is zero. Upper diagonal at zero is 0, 0.0, all right? And now we can create the coefficient matrix A is MP dot diag, lower diagonal minus one plus MP dot diagonal main diagonal at zero plus MP dot diagonal for the upper diagonal. Um, I'm gonna put one, right? Because that's the index of the diagonal and the big matrix. Okay, so combine those into one big matrix. Okay, and if you're in doubt, print it out. So there you go. Okay, so it's a lot of points that are gonna show nicely. All right, there's another trick to make it show nicely, but it's, I think it will just confuse things. So I'm just gonna do less points here. Um, still a lot, maybe we do five points. Okay, so now you see in the lower diagonal, 
we have ones and then zero at the end. In the main diagonal, I have one and one at the end points and then the value minus two plus h delta x squared. It's a negative value, so that's a good sign. And for the upper diagonal, I have zero and ones everywhere. Okay. So now we need to build the right-hand side. Build the right-hand side. And the right-hand side was minus, most of them were minus t infinity times h times delta x squared. So minus h times dx squared times t infinity. The first entry was t left. And the last entry was t right. Okay, so that anchors the solution. Okay, and finally, solution is mp dot lin algebra dot solve a comma right hand side. And then we can plot it versus x and you get a crash. Okay, r h as zero is equal to t left does not support. Oh, dot ones. That's right. Thank you. Okay, now it looks jagged because we only have five points. I'm going to do this 200 points. And you get this nice curve, right, as expected. You got 300 at the left point, 200 at the right point, and the middle, was, we're heating it, so that temperature should increase in the middle. And if you recall what I explained to you about H, the higher the H, the more effective that heat transfer is. So if I put a large value for H, Let's go to 1,000. It's going to be almost flat, right? There you go. So that H tells, it means that we put the rod in a fluid that has a very high convective heat transfer coefficient. It's able to pass on heat much, much more effectively to the rod. If H is very small, it means it's very resistive to the air blowing at it. And in fact, it will be almost a straight line. Right? And again, if you think about it, the heat equation, for the heat equation, if capital H is small, then that makes the heat equation second derivative equal almost zero. The answer to that is a straight line for the temperature, right? So we are consistent. At least sanity checks, right? Well, it depends. In this, in this situation, which is quite idealized, but you, you can effectively control the boundary very, very, very well. You could have a bath of fluid fixed at an infinite bath. It's going to make that point fixed at that temperature. So now with heat, what happens in reality, H is a function of the temperature. So you cannot keep pushing it you know, too high, it will actually just adjust a little bit. But yeah, you can see something like this and it will drop off. Yeah, right at the end. Yeah, yeah. So we're gonna, we're gonna cover that next. We will, yeah. It becomes nonlinear. If H is a function of temperature, then that discretization is gonna result in a nonlinear equation. You have to solve a system of nonlinear equations. That's the only difference. So we're gonna do that after, okay? All right. You guys need a minute? One more minute? One, two, three. <laughs> if, so this should be a review of your early on the notebooks for um, linear solvers, right? So you can grab one of those as well, notebooks, and just kind of try to blend it into it. I know some of you are already doing that for homework, uh, for homework 10, okay? That was part of Larry. <laughs> Is it still uh, intact? Okay, good. <laughs> All right, should we go back to the slides? Yeah? Okay. All right, so this is good. Awesome. There's a couple of more 
kinks I want to add to complicate things uh, because things without a challenge, right, are no fun. So let's challenge things a little bit. Right now, so far, we covered only one type of condition at the boundary, and that is called a Dirichlet boundary condition. Okay, when you specify in a boundary value problem, when you specify the value of the dependent variable at the boundary, so when you specify the temperature, or when you specify phi, this is called a Dirichlet type boundary condition. Phi at the left point is some value. Phi at the right point is some other value. You're anchoring the value of the dependent variable. Then you get what's called a Dirichlet boundary condition. There's another type of boundary condition called Newman boundary condition. And with Newman boundary condition, is rather than specifying the value, excuse me, you specify the slope or the rate at which that quantity is changing. And oftentimes, that is easier to specify experimentally in practice. We can specify a heat addition rate to the rod rather than specify a value of the temperature at the rod. Because heat addition, we can tie that to a rate of electric current, for example, if you're heating the rod at the end with a specific rate. So you can estimate the heat um, rate, the heating rate from the electric current which is kind of easier to do so. This type of boundary condition, Newman boundary condition, is given by a derivative at the boundary, derivative of the dependent variable. Okay. But this poses a problem now. Because we can no longer say t at the end point is equal to t right. We have a derivative now. What are you going to do with the derivative? Okay. So let's see. Now, this is the new setup. I'm fixing the temperature at one end, and I'm specifying a slope at the other end. Okay. Now, our previous discretized equation is still valid at all of those points, okay? All to t2, all the way to tn, tn minus 1. And then there's this last point. We have nothing at the, at the, at the boundary. We have a Newman boundary condition. I'm like, how do we, what are we, what are we going to do there? What do we do there? So what we would have to do is also discretize the boundary condition. So not only the governing equation, we also have to convert the boundary condition into a discrete formula because we cannot deal with a total, with, a, with an exact continuous derivative. Okay. So here's how this is going to work. If I were to apply the governing equation just close to that endpoint. So suppose we're just applying it at that endpoint Tn, right? You take this formula, you apply it at n, you get Tn minus 1, which is part of the solution good. You get Tn, which now has to be part of the solution. Remember, when you specify the slope, you're not specifying the value. You don't know what the value is yet until you solve the entire problem. So in a way, the entire problem has to figure out how to adjust itself to match that slope. Once you match that slope, you get the value Tn at the endpoint. So now that makes Tn part of the solution process itself. Previously, with Dirichlet conditions, we had the value of Tn. It was beta, it was alpha, it was whatever, right? Right now, we don't, okay? But it's still part of the solution. But then you get Tn plus 1 if you are to apply the governing equation. But we don't have Tn plus 1. Tn plus 1 is outside the domain. We don't, we don't have it. Okay? So this Tn plus 1 doesn't exist. Unless, for a moment, we imagine that there is a fictitious point outside that rod that corresponds to Tn plus 1. This point doesn't exist in our solution process. We're going to eliminate it. But we're just kind of employing this machinery now to allow us to do the math, and we're never going to see that extra point ever again. This is, in practice, we call this a ghost point. If you take CFD with me in the summer, it's all going to be about ghost points. We have thousands of ghost points that allow us to be able to do the math rationally. OK, so imagine now for a moment there's this ghost point. I don't want it to be a part of the solution, but 
if I discretize the, the governing equation, it gives me a Tn plus 1. Okay, what are we going to do with it? To eliminate Tn plus 1, now we can go ahead and use the boundary condition, the Newman boundary condition. So now if I were to take this Newman boundary condition, dt by dx at n, right? This is evaluated right at the boundary. And if I do a central difference, this gives me tn plus 1 minus tn minus 1 over 2 delta x equal beta. Aha. So now, this is, this is the point I want to eliminate. But now I, I can express tn plus 1 in terms of beta, a known quantity, delta x, a known quantity, and tn minus 1, which is part of the solution, right? So we eliminate tn plus 1 altogether. This is how it works. You take this, you write tn plus 1, and now you take it and plug it back in here. So when you put this value for tn plus 1 up there, you no longer have tn plus 1. You've, el if you've entirely eliminated it. So that ghost point served only as a temporary step to allow us to do the math correctly, right? But we expressed that point in terms of quantities we're solving for anyway, and which is just, just going to be part of the solution process, right? So when you substitute into that equation, okay, and you rearrange things, so we can go through the math here, that equation at the last point is no longer Tn equal beta, like with Dirichlet conditions, or Tn equal T right. It's actually some other equation relating Tn minus 1 and Tn and to beta and a bunch of other things. It's just different, but we have no ghost points, thankfully. Okay? So now, when you write this, the only difference between a Newman problem and a Dirichlet problem is that at the boundary where there's a Newman condition, you cannot say the value of the temperature equal the given value. You have to do this process of discretization. You write, you discretize the governing equation at the end point, you add a ghost point, you discretize the boundary condition itself. When I say the word discretize, I mean convert the total derivative, the exact derivative, into a discrete formula using a finite difference formula, okay? So by discretizing the governing equation at the end point, add a ghost point, discretize the boundary condition, that allows you to eliminate that ghost point, plug it back into the governing equation at, that, at n, and you're done, okay? So for our system of equations now, we still have that tridiagonal structure, except now the last equation is a little different. It's no longer 1 times Tn equal T right. It's actually 2T4, two 2Tn two minus 1 minus this thing times Tn equal H delta T minus H delta T squared minus 2 beta delta X. Now this system, what it's going to do, it's going to figure out how the temperature looks like inside the rod so you get the right slope at the end point, okay? It's pretty cool. It's just, but there's no mystery here. It's just applying more and more math. Yes? I was just wondering why you have to do that at the end because it's not the beginning. You still have I didn't get the question. So, you know how you have to figure out the ghost point on the right boundary? Because the left boundary is given. That's fine, because Tn, all the blue points are part of the solution. For each blue point, I have one equation. So if I have, if for point n, I have an equation that is function of all the other points, that's okay. Because that's still part of the unknowns. It's x, y. It's, it's, t, it's every equation could be a function of all the other unknowns, as long as they're part of the system, right? So that's what a system of equations is. I don't know if that answers your question. I'm still not clear about the question. For Tn minus 1, for the equation at Tn minus 1, it's only a function of Tn minus 2 and Tn. Right? So it's already a function of all the other unknowns. There's nothing new in here, right? We agreed when we began we only have those blue points. Right? We only have this blue. But the last point introduced a new point outside the domain. We're just going to treat that for a minute, and then we eliminate that. Absolutely. All the way from 1 to Tn, they're all in your domain. 
okay, and part of your equations. Okay, so let's go ahead and um, and program this. Okay, so we'll do it now. The same problem, but with um, with Newman conditions. Now, I can put this condition on the left. Okay, I can put it on the right. The same analysis holds. Okay, the same analysis, the same approach holds. All right, so now there's a cool thing also to do when you want to verify if your solution is correct. And when we plot the solution, we're going to look at the slope. We're going to try with a positive slope, so the temperature needs to be pointing up. We're going to try with a zero slope. It's going to be flat at the boundary. And we're going to tr try with a negative slope. It's going to be pointing down. Okay? A positive slope means we're adding heat. A zero slope means it's insulated. And a negative slope, it means we're drawing heat out. Okay, so those three scenarios we're going to look at. The coding is going to be exactly the same. So I'm going to copy everything here and put it here, except for the last point here. Okay, so if I look at this last equation, I have for the lower diagonal, the last point is going, the first point, the last point is going to, to be uh, two. So for the lower diagonal, where's the lower diagonal? The last point is going to be 2 instead of 0. Okay? Now, for the main diagonal, only the first point is 1, and everything else is minus 2 plus h delta x squared. So I'm going to eliminate this one. And for the upper diagonal, it still it remains the same. 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Why? Because we didn't change the temperature at the left point. If we change the temperature at the left point, you're going to have a change in the upper diagonal rather than the lower diagonal. Okay. Okay. So now that gives us the coefficient matrix. And if you want to check, so you can print it. We do, let's say, five points and print A. Okay. Got it. Lower diagonal one, 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 and two at the end. And, upper, and the main diagonal only has one at the first entry, and then everything else is the same value. And then for the upper diagonal is zero and then ones. Perfect. Okay, so now for the right-hand side. The right-hand side, the first entry is t left. Everything is minus h delta x squared t infinity. And the last entry has a, this additional term, minus 2 beta delta x. Okay, so for the last entry, I'm going to just subtract from it um, 2 times beta times dx. What is beta? We're going to specify that right now. So beta, let's start with a positive slope. So we expect the temperature, if the slope is 1, we expect the temperature curve to have a slope of 1 right at the ad end point, OK? And we're going to put H, we'll go back to 10. Okay. Let's see. Okay, so let me put 100 points here. All right. So it's not very clear here, kind of the slope. Right, so let me make it a little bit um, stronger, maybe 10. Okay. It is sloping upward. So if you draw the slope here, I know it looks like it's almost zero, but it's not. It's kind of pointing pointing positively. Okay, we can even make the slope higher so that we're adding more heat at the end point. And notice, though, the value of the temperature at the right point, it changes with the value of the slope. So when you specify the slope, you don't know what the temperature is going to be. The temperature is going to be dictated by everything else going on in the heat balance of the rod. Okay, it just so happens now with these numbers that I have, that this temperature at the end is like maybe 480, okay? And you can change A, H, for example, let's do 100. And then you see how it kind of tries to slope up a little bit? Okay, it goes flat here and then tries to slope up a little bit. Now it's 500. It's not anchored at a specific value. The only thing that's anchored at the end point is the slope. That's it. If we put a negative slope, it should point down. So I'm going to put minus 10 for the slope. All right, it's kind of slightly trying to point down, right? You see it at just a little bit down, okay? So let's make a stronger slope, minus 100. See how it's dipping down? 
it's trying to draw heat. But it's not drawing heat fast enough compared to the rest of the problem. Okay, so we have to draw heat at a higher rate maybe. Okay, so maybe we put beta is equal minus 1,000. Then you see it how it's dipping, right? It's really bringing it down. You don't anchor the temperature, Davin. What is an example like when you would know that like Like I said, so it's in practice, it's, not, it's much easier to set a rate, especially like with heat transfer, this could be tied into current, which we know the rate of the current from the power that you have, right? How many amps you're using, which is current, right, per, per unit time. And so from that, you could tell how your heating is, what you're heating, then you'd have the heat rate, how many like watts per joules per second, right? So how many joules per second? That gives you the heating rate. You don't get the temperature, right? So in your electric oven, it's, it's really, it's kind of doesn't know what the temperature is. Why does it turn off and on, right? If you have an, an electric coil oven, right, it's, it's on and then it's off and then it's on and then it's off. Why? Because it turns off when it reaches a certain temperature. But what it is setting when you set it to high or medium or low, it's just setting a rate of heating, right? You cannot tell what the temperature is. If you put, it's, if you put a pan of cold water, it's going to be on until the pan starts heating up, which is going to make it everything hot, then it's going to turn off and then on and off and on and off, right? But you can't tell that temperature. The temperature will be determined eventually by everything else in the system. Now, to fix a temperature, it's, it's usually harder, but you need like a big bath of a hot or a cool liquid that's maintained independently at a fixed temperature, but it's, all, it's very hard to do that, okay? So typically slopes or rates are easier, just like ODEs describe rates because it's easier to think about rates rather than nominal values, okay? Now, if we put it at zero, it's just going to go flat, exactly flat, okay? So if you evaluate the slope here between the last two points, it should be zero, exactly, because that slope d, dt by dx at the end is equal to zero. Okay, it's probably not very clear with h being um, so high, but yeah, if you kind of come here, if you evaluate, let me add more points actually. This could make it look better, put 500 points. So you see that slope at the end, the last two points is trying to be zero, right, at that point. But that's what I would expect from this problem, okay? Now, what I did here, I used a central difference approximation for Tn plus 1 and Tn minus 1. So it's really trying to set the slope between Tn plus 1 and Tn minus 1 rather than exactly at Tn, right? So I could have made the slope between Tn plus 1 and Tn to be 0. So that would make it a, forward dif a backward difference, but it would make it first order. So it would drop order in your entire solution, right? Because a first, first order difference approximation is first order, backward difference. Everything else is second order, so it's going to be problematic. Okay, let's do an example. So this is the type of example you, you would see on the homework or on, on an exam. You're given this ODE, second derivative of u with respect to x, equal x squared u, and then on the left boundary now, so I swapped the boundaries, okay? So now on the left boundary, you have a Newman condition, du by dx at x equals 0 is equal to alpha, and then you have a Dirichlet boundary at the right point, which, is equal, which, is, which says un is equal to beta. Okay, so now I swap this. And we're going to do this together, so forget the questions. Now, write, the first question is write the discretized equation at an arbitrary point, uh, arbitrary interior points. I'm not thinking about the boundaries, okay? So at an arbitrary interior point, you look up your finite difference formula, right? Like we did before, you apply this equation at all points, and then you turn the derivative using its second derivative. The, this is the only approximation we got for that that's kind of central. And you get ui minus 1 minus 2ui two, two plus ui plus 1 over delta x squared equal the right-hand side evaluated at any point i. Okay, good. So this applies at all the points. So you can convert that very nicely like this. Then at the left boundary, i equal 1, we need to, we have a ghost point, 
okay? Because if you take i equal 1 and put it here, you're going to get u0 minus blah, blah, u1 plus u2. We don't have u0 because 0 is outside the domain. If you're indexing from 0, then you'd have u minus 1, which is the ghost point. That anything outside the domain is going to be a ghost point. We're going to treat the ghost point temporarily so we can eliminate it. To eliminate it, okay, so this would be the equation. This would be this generic standard discretization formula. Applied at point 1, it introduces a u0 ghost point. Okay? To eliminate u0, we discretize the Newman boundary condition. So the Newman boundary condition, <laughs> it's kind of so small here. Um, <laughs> We're just going to use a standard central difference, du by dx at x equals 0. It's u2 minus u0 over 2 delta x. It's simply the, the difference between the two values. Remember, u2 and u0, those are values. So u2 minus u0 is the rise over the run. The run is 2 delta x spacing, okay? Is equal to alpha, which is given to us. So I know alpha delta x, u2 is part of the solution. I can then extract u0 equal u2 minus 2 alpha delta x. Now I'm going to take this and plug it back here. Okay? And that's how I eliminate the ghost point. Right? So when I take u0 equal u2 minus 2 delta x alpha, plug it in here, I get this, um, this formula. Okay, so that gives me the governing equation at the first point, at point u1. Everything else is the same in the middle for this equation. Okay, then everything is this equation until the last point, which is un equal to beta at the right boundary, un equal to beta. So this is like an example problem of what you will get in the exam or which is also on your homework. You get to ex exercise all of these um, ideas. Then you just write this in matrix form. Okay, so now notice, remember when I told you the upper diagonal will change if we put a Newman condition on the on the left boundary, and the first entry in the main diagonal changed, okay? The last entry didn't change here because that's the last point, u1 times un equal beta, that's the last boundary, right? And then you solve it like we did before, okay? Okay, here's another equation. This is called the advection diffusion equation. Okay, now we're getting into really fun chemical engineering stuff. Um, we will study this at extreme length um, in, in partial differential equations or computational fluid dynamics. I think you have a problem like that in your homework assignment. So here I don't have any Newman boundary conditions. I have two fixed values for the temperature, but I have a different differential equation. You're used to the second derivative equal to something, but now I have a second derivative and I have a first derivative. Do we know how to solve this? Yeah, just apply the finite difference formulas to each one of those derivatives. Now, this equation describes the two, pri two primary physical mechanisms that you learn about in chemical engineering. Diffusion, which I've been talking about, which is like a heat transfer or a mass transfer process. Okay, it occurs at a diffusion scale at a molecular level. Mole molecules are vibrating and talking to each other, communicating. Um, the other term describes motion due to air or a liquid. And that U is the speed of that fluid. So it's like you have a stick of incense and you leave it kind of slowly bringing that aroma everywhere. Then you put a fan in front of it. That fan is going to bring that incense smell, spread it faster, right? So that process of the fan moving the air at a speed u, that process is that second term, very simply. u dt by dx. So if t described the concentration of the incense, then you're spreading that with that mechanism, u times dt by dx. That's how it's, it's spread, OK? So how, what can we do here? Same thing. We apply the finite difference approximation or discretization to this equation. We split our domain into equally spaced point, call them delta x. Each one has a value x. And then I'm going to fix the temperatures at both ends, t1 equal alpha, tn is equal beta, and I assign a value of, at every point. And now I start building my discrete equations for t1 equal alpha. That's the first equation. In the middle, 
I use a central discretization on all terms, right? Because I need to be second order in space. So I need to make sure I have an order delta x squared. Remember your numerical calculus. I need an order delta x squared approximation on all derivatives. This is the first de approximation for the second derivative, which is the central scheme. And then for the first derivative, similar to the Newman condition, right? It's a first derivative. I use a second order approximation. Okay, t i plus one, i minus one, i plus one, i minus one, i. Everything is function of everything else, great. I reorganize the terms. Remember, put coefficients times unknown, coefficient times unknown, coefficient times unknown. There's, they're all equal to zero here, there's no source terms. There's nothing on the right hand side, okay? And then when you build this system of equations, you still get a tridiagonal matrix. Okay, same as before, but you have different kind of coefficients, different terms everywhere in all of these diagonals, okay? T1 is equal to alpha, everywhere else here is equal to this um, 1 minus u delta x over 2d, and then the main diagonal is going to have um, minus 2s in it everywhere. The upper diagonal is going to have 1 plus u delta x, right? And then you write the system of equations and you solve it. There's zeros everywhere on the right-hand side here but then there's alpha and beta at both ends, okay? So this is, make sure you practice this problem, okay? Make sure you practice this problem at home, you know how to do it. Especially if I ask you to do different discretizations. So I might ask you, for example, I might ask you to do a different discretization for, ah, come on. So I'll give you a formulary and everything, all the discretize, all the uh, numerical calculus approximations, but I might ask you to do something different. I might tell you do a forward or backward difference here. Okay, so you should be able to do that. Rather than having i plus 1 and i minus 1, you'll have i plus 1 minus i, or i minus i minus 1. Okay? Doesn't, it changes the equations, but the procedure is the same. There's really an unlimited number of ways I, we can solve this problem using different formulas for the discretizations, okay? And with that, we're up to nonlinear boundary value problems. It's a good time to take like a three, four minute break, okay? And then we'll wrap it up with nonlinear boundary value problems, okay? Am I looking at something? Okay, when, when you load it up. <laughs> it's a, sometimes it's bad. I've, I've, uh, I've had some students who struggle just logging in. So even you, especially during exams, which is the worst thing, right? You have to tether. <laughs> Vastly different. This is for my linear algebra. This is solve. Oh, they should be identical. Yeah. Yeah. So you have an issue with uh, probably a sign issue, a boundary condition issue. Mm -hmm. So this one is this the right but 350 and 300, right? That was what the problem required. Yeah. Yeah. Same here. Oh no, not even close to here. Yeah. So this is not close. So you have something going on here. So some with the boundary something. So I'll review. Yeah, so your boundary minus B, and B is 350, right? Mm -hmm. Y A, no, what? Y A 1 minus alpha, the derivative? Should be Y A 0. That hopefully helps. No? It's the, that numby. Mm -hmm. Oh, hey, look at that. Yeah, so YA1 gives you the slope. Yeah. So if you were to do the, um, the Newman condition, you could do it this way. So, so you would do YA1 or YB1, <laughs> right? So that would give you a, a Newman boundary condition. I wrote, I just wrote quick, because hmm? it was just on the last slide here. I, got, I was kind of confused. How does this transform to this? Um, okay, so TI minus, let me think, let me buffer. Uh, <laughs> A little bit. Um, 
Yes, so this is TI. Yes, yeah, so if you take um, D mm -hmm. out for TI and this one, take D out of all of them, you divide by D for this term. So if you were to multiply by D everywhere, mm -hmm. okay, so you get DTI minus 1, okay, over delta X. If you were to multiply by... Um, I'm sure the math works. You just kind of take a couple of steps for it. So you okay. have, for ti minus 1, you have d over delta x squared, okay, minus, at least we have the minus sign, right? Minus u over 2 delta x times ti minus 1, okay? Oh, and so then, this is in and terms then, of ti minus 1. Yeah, oh, that's yeah. Where so, I was so, so that's the coefficient. And then you multiply by delta x squared and divide by d, and then you just get this, this cleaner form. Okay. okay. I'm sure. I'm sure it's correct, but try to carry the algebra explicitly from here, and then see how I simplified it to this form. Okay. okay. I think it's that's just a, it's just possible. algebraic, just some algebraic operations. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think, and then multi I then multiply by delta x squared divided by d, and then you get that. Okay. Did, did you get this, all the signatures? Okay, because they didn't show up today. Yeah, good. Okay, perfect. No, that's good. That's, I mean, yeah, that's great. If anyone else wants to sign, yeah, give them like, tell them, you know, by Friday or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Did anyone do add any more since yesterday? No, okay. Okay, okay. Just gonna wait till Friday then? Yeah, okay. And then the visa, visa cards. I think that will be best. Do they cost you the visa cards? Do they cost? If they cost, then uh, we'll just give them cash. If they can cost you five dollars to do a yeah, silly visa, it's not worth it. Yeah. Then, then you can pay. Then we just do cash, okay? Yeah, give them an envelope in cash. Money talks, man. Cash is king. And and Lily, we roll them with a rubber band, like one single dollar bills. <laughs> Actually, that would be. No, no, we'll go to the bank, we'll get single dollar bills, and then, yeah. <laughs> uh, seems like we <laughs> like we had some mafia deal, right? I am Tony, all right, and so, and you're, you look Italian, so you're Lily from Sicily, so. <laughs> all right. Nonlinear boundary value problems, the, the cream of the cream on top of the cream on top of the cherry. That's kind of how we can complicate things more. Okay, so the setup here is this, that same heat transfer problem in that rod, except now we have radiation involved. So remember we solved the, a problem similar to this one, okay, when we had t to the power 4 minus t infinity to the power 4. I don't, did we solve a problem like that? No, I, sh I think I show, yeah, I think I showed you s something related to that. Today we're going to learn how to solve this problem, actually. Okay, so now our equation has a fourth power on temperature. Now that's going to complicate things a little bit. Okay, if you cannot see it from now, you'll see it once we discretize the equations, okay? So I'm going to ask you to try to use this second order, this central difference formula to convert at any interim interior point to convert this ODE into a discrete formula at any point I. Okay, so go ahead, try that, just like we've been doing. Take that equation, if you apply it at point I, you're gonna get second derivative at I equal alpha T I to the power four minus t infinity to the power 4. You then convert that second derivative using that discrete formula and try to rearrange terms. Then let's see what happens. I actually ask you to attempt to write it in matrix form. So you have Dirichlet conditions. You got the equations at the first and last points. Mm -hmm. 
Bravo. Yes. Now write it down, Davin. <laughs> you should have a tip about stealing pencils. <laughs> like, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. You can't because it is not linear. You can't. You cannot. If it's not linear, you cannot put in a matrix, right? That's the point. Yeah, we'll have to solve a system of nonlinear equations now. Yep. You cannot put your TIs on one side. You can't separate that. You can put them on one side, it doesn't matter. But like, now think about it. What is, you're trying to solve for, so now write this equation at point zero, point, point one, point two, point three, et cetera. And you're gonna see a system of nonlinear equations, right? And then you have to put, write them in residual form. And at least try, at least try, So pretty. <laughs> Everyone is looking at it in awe. <laughs> it's so pretty. <laughs> hey, good, good to have you back. Hopefully that lecture yes, helped out. <laughs> at least someone is watching them. <laughs> no, I no no absolutely not absolutely not. I it just takes me a minute sometimes because I have to edit it and take some time to convert it and upload it and put the titles etc so I was on my task list anyway you just kind of bumped it a little bit sooner so I'm like no of course <laughs> yeah so so what do you observe when you do this can you if you were to write this equation for all the points one two three four all the way what do you get you're solving for T1, T1 you have it, you're solving for T2, T3, T4. What are the equations for T1, for T2, T3, T4? What kind of equations they are? How does T2, T3, T4, etc. show up? How do they show up? One second. I want to see what's, what's happening next. Okay, what's happening next? So first, do you have the equation at point I? At least I hope you'll be able to do that. Do we have the equation at, some, at, uh, at any point I? Okay, what is it, Tanner? <laughs> okay, so if you were to write the, if you were to discretize this at any point I, Okay, so it could be two, two, three, four, all the way to the end. It's ti plus one minus two ti plus ti minus one delta x squared. Why? Why is this? Because that's kind of the standard finite difference formula for the second derivative. So I will give you a formulary in the exam with all of these derivatives. You just got to take that formula and apply it. But on the right-hand side, it's ti to the power four. T infinity is known, alpha is known. You get ti to the power four. Now, if you think about it, this equation, if you rearrange it, even multiply by delta x squared, you got, you're solving for all the ti's and i plus 1 and i minus 1, right? So those go, those are t2, t3, t4. If you put i equal 1 here, or sorry, if you put i equal 2, you're going to get an equation for, you, you'll have t3 minus 2 t2 plus t1 equal alpha delta x squared t, t2, t2 to the power 4. So when you think about it, these are, these involve the unknowns in a nonlinear manner. The unknowns, which are the, your ti's, okay, or ti minus one, ti plus one, one of them at least shows up nonlinearly. So you cannot solve this. This is not a linear system of equations. It is, in fact, a very large system of nonlinear equations. At each one of those points in your rod, exclude t1 and t, tn, 
at each one of those points, you have a nonlinear equation. And it cannot be solved independently of the others because to solve the equation at T2, you're going to have T3 involved. To solve the equation at T3, you have T2 and T4 involved. And all of those show up nonlinearly. Okay, so you have a lot of nonlinear equations lumped together. So it is a system of nonlinear equations. And guess what? We know how to solve a system of nonlinear equations, right? So that's why we did the tools in the beginning. If you, if you look at the trajectory of this course, initially we spent a lot of time on linear solvers and nonlinear solvers because they were critical in everything else we did. They showed up in interpolation, in regression, in integration, and in differential equations. So in, some, in one way, ODEs is nothing more than building on the tools that we've already developed before. So that's the sense that this course is comprehensive. I cannot teach nonlinear boundary value problems without referring back to Newton's method or F-solve, okay? Now, once you hear nonlinear equation, you think of a residual form. So then you write the residual at, arbitra at an arbitrary point like this, essentially, right? And then at the left point, the residual is T1 minus T left, and at the right point, the residual is Tn minus T right. So now you have a, a system of residual forms, R1, R2, R3, all the way to the last point. And guess what? All of them can be programmed automatically in Python, if you want to do that in Python, okay? And for Newman conditions, we can do the same thing. So we did this now with Dirichlet conditions, right? The only thing that changed here is the right-hand side, okay? The only thing that changed here is the right-hand side. Now, you don't have a nonlinear derivative, but sometimes you might have a derivative squared or cubed, right? So that complicates things that adds nonlinearity also on the derivative side, okay? But you have a, once you have a nonlinear equation, it's a nonlinear equation. However, that form of nonlinearity shows up if it's a power, if it's a sine or a cosine or an exponential. It's just a nonlinear equation, right? You just put it as part of the, your nonlinear system of equations. The boundary conditions also, the idea of boundary conditions also applies. In this case, we had Dirichlet conditions, but you can do it with Newman conditions. So here I have the Newman condition on the right-hand side, and then you do the same thing. You get the residual at point I, okay? This is the residual at point I at, any, at ar an arbitrary point, okay? And then the residual at point N, at that last point after you do the substitution, of the boundary condition, of the Newman boundary condition, and you eliminate Tn plus one, you get something different for the residual form. It's just another residual equation, okay? And that's it. I can show you how to program it, but since I'm not asking you to do it in the, in the, in the homework, um, you know, it's a little bit um, involved, but it's doable. It's, it's, not, that, it's not that hard but it's a little bit involved. So, you know, if you want, we can do it. If, if not, it's like I'm being one of those modern physicians where they ask you, what do you want me to prescribe to do to you today? Or what do you want to do about, you know, your broken limb? I'm like, fix it. You choose. You tell me what to do with it, right? Um, anyway. Okay, so um, if we're, 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 we're really done, okay? If you want to listen about partial differential equations, I'll, I'll refer you to the lecture from last year. I'll post it on the, we're a little bit behind this year. Usually this, in this lecture, I would be doing um, uh, more of partial differential equations stuff. But I'll refer you to the lecture from last year if you want to, if you want to watch that. Um, and I'll see you on Thursday. Before you go, we have the tip from Juliana, right? You gotta come up, you have a tip, no tip. <laughs> Yes, so we have the life hack from Juliana, and on Thursday, machine learning, I will send out an announcement, okay? And don't forget, for Tuesday of next week, you have to be present in class to get credit for the, as a homework assignment for the student feedback, okay? If you, if you don't, if you, if, unless, you ha unless you have a very legitimate reason to not come to class, 
like, you know, you're on the beach and a lobster comes up and you have a fight with like 15 lobsters and you're like all bitten by lobsters, then okay, don't come to class, please heal. Go to a doctor who knows how to fix things, who doesn't ask you what you need to do. But if really you have a pressing reason you cannot come, please email me um, like as immediately. But I expect you to be in class on Tuesday, okay? Next week. <laughs>